Hello, my name is Jesse Trushensky, and I'm an associate professor with the Center for Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. In this presentation, I'm going to describe the economic, ecological, and cultural importance of fisheries in the United States, and highlight the role that hatcheries play in contributing to our nation's fisheries. Our nation's fisheries. When you hear that phrase, images like these might come to mind. It's a feel-good phrase, our nation's fisheries, that makes those of us who work in fisheries bow our chest with a bit of all-American pride. But when asked, what exactly are our nation's fisheries? What are they worth? Why should I care? Many of us wouldn't be able to come up with a complete, sensible description on the spot. Many of us that work in fisheries have a gut feeling about what this phrase means, but it can be a challenge to explain convincingly why fisheries and what we do to support healthy, robust fisheries is important to the average American. My goal in this presentation is to capture this concept of our nation's fisheries, make it tangible, and describe some of the ways in which these fisheries and hatcheries support the American way of life. The first aspect of our nation's fisheries that I want to talk about is commercial fishing. You might not be engaged in commercial fishing yourself, but there's a good chance that you are periodically engaged in eating seafood and are affected by the state of the U.S. economy. Those are two very important ways in which our nation's fisheries benefit the American people. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to show you facts and figures to illustrate the importance of our nation's fisheries, and in many cases, I'm going to put this in the context of dollars and cents. In 2012, 9.6 billion pounds of fish and shellfish were landed at U.S. ports. Although this volume is down a bit in comparison with years past, the value of U.S. commercial fisheries is actually on the rise. You can see the economic impact of these fisheries in the statistics summarized in this infographic. Close to 1.3 million Americans are employed thanks to commercial fisheries, generating $38.7 billion in direct income and more than $140 billion in sales. Now that's just marine fisheries. Freshwater commercial fishing is a much smaller industry, but these fisheries are still significant in terms of providing food and economic opportunity, often in regions where both are critically needed. In Florida, for example, about 14 million pounds of fish worth more than $5 million are landed annually by commercial fishermen. In Illinois, commercial fishing has actually increased in recent years as fishermen have begun to target invasive Asian carp. Although these are comparatively low value fisheries and the operations are small, they're giving Americans living in regions with limited opportunities the chance to improve their financial circumstances. Regardless of whether it's freshwater or marine, industrial or artisanal, commercial fisheries are an essential part of our nation's fisheries. As I said, there are quite a few Americans that fish for a living, but there are many, many more of us that fish for fun and recreational fishing is another major element of our nation's fisheries. It's really difficult for those of us that enjoy fishing to put a price on a relaxing day on the water, but what economists tell us is that recreational fishing contributes about $62 billion to gross domestic product every year. In contrast to commercial fishing, freshwater fisheries are the most important in terms of the value of recreational fishing, though the economic impacts of rec fishing in coastal areas is still significant. Now, $62 billion seems like a lot, it is. To put that into perspective, if recreational fishing were a company, it would rank number 51 on the Fortune 500 list. That puts it ahead of Lockheed Martin, Intel, Chrysler, and Google. Even if you're like me and have lost more than your fair share of lures, recreational fishing is still considered a relatively inexpensive hobby. Recreational fishing is big business, not because it's an expensive pastime, but because so many people do it. There are roughly 60 million anglers in America. That's more people than play golf or tennis combined. And when these millions and millions of people go fishing, they generate $115 billion in total economic output and support more than 828,000 jobs. They also generate an additional $15 billion in state and federal taxes, a considerable portion of which goes back into sport fish restoration. Creating economic opportunity, supporting aquatic resource conservation, and providing so many of us with a needed break from the daily grind. Recreational fishing is one of the most essential elements of our nation's fisheries. Your neighbor, a member of Congress, or the person next to you in line at the grocery store may or may not care about wetting a line themselves. But one thing they are all likely to value is the strength of the U.S. economy. So let's take a moment to consider the cumulative economic impact of commercial and recreational fisheries. 
Together, they are responsible for $199 billion in sales impacts and support 1.7 million jobs throughout the country. Again, that seems like a lot, and it is, but let's try for some context. Walmart is currently the largest single employer in the United States. It's almost impossible to imagine, but Walmart employs 1% of the entire American workforce. How many people is that? 1.4 million Americans. If you can say that you're bigger than Walmart, and commercial and recreational fishing definitely can, I think it's safe to say that you help drive the U.S. economy. Commercial and recreational fishing are central to the American economy and the concept of our nation's fisheries, but these resources aren't the exclusive property of the United States of America. We share our fisheries with tribal and First Nations. Fish and fishing are central to the subsistence of indigenous people as well as the continuity of their traditional ways of life. The U.S. government recognizes the sovereignty of many tribal nations and must fulfill various treaty and statutory obligations to guarantee the right to fish. But whether you're part of a Native American community or your family immigrated here in the recent or distant past, fishing is a part of our cultural identity and part of what it means to be an American. Whether you're talking about our nation's fisheries in the context of commercial fisheries, recreational fishing opportunities, or fulfilling tribal trust responsibilities, you have to consider the importance of hatcheries. Hatcheries have been a part of our nation's fisheries for well over 150 years, and virtually all fisheries and wildlife conservation efforts can be traced back to fish culture and the creation of hatcheries to support fishing in the United States. The American Fisheries Society, the oldest and largest professional organization dedicated to the fishery sciences, was originally formed in 1870 as the American Fish Culturist Association to support the interests of those engaged in fish propagation. Shortly after, in 1871, President Grant established the U.S. Fish Commission, and in 1872, the first federal fish hatchery was opened on the McLeod River in California. Today, the U.S. Fish Commission is known as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Baird Hatchery and its counterparts are now known as the National Fish Hatchery System. It's interesting to think that an entire federal agency dedicated to conserving all kinds of natural resources got its start in culturing fish for stock enhancement. In fisheries conservation, we often talk about the three legs of the stool, harvest control, hatcheries, and habitat. Early approaches to fisheries management in North America focused exclusively on restrictive harvest regulations. These were unpopular with the public as well as ineffective. Resource managers then switched focus to hatcheries, assuming that stocking would restore declining catches. Stocking alone has also proven largely ineffective. More recently, there has been an increasing emphasis on habitat restoration, which is laudable and important, but also unlikely to be effective in restoring fisheries without the help of harvest control measures and hatchery support. Successful fisheries conservation programs draw from each of the three H's. Hatcheries are essential now, and perhaps even more so in the future, for putting fish into the nets of anglers, commercial fishermen, and tribal communities. So let's look at some brief examples. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has estimated that its National Fish Hatchery System stocking programs support 13.5 million angler days, generate more than $550 million in retail sales, and more than $900 million in industry output. They also support more than 8,000 jobs. We've already talked about the economic relevance of recreational fishing, and a pretty good chunk of that is associated with federal, and perhaps more importantly, state stocking programs. In terms of commercial fisheries, the best examples come from the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, where hatchery origin fish contribute greatly to commercial catches of salmon. Depending on the year, hatchery fish represent 14 to 37 percent of the total statewide Alaskan salmon harvest. Whether it's in the context of put-and-take recreational fisheries, mitigation stocking, or supporting commercial harvest, you cannot talk about our nation's fisheries without considering hatcheries. While we're on the subject of hatcheries, I think it's worth noting that they are more than just fish factories, and their contribution to our nation's fisheries goes well beyond the fish they produce. Not all tourists are anglers, and not all people that care about fish are fishermen. The hatcheries themselves are tourist attractions, and some of them are quite popular. For example, a recent assessment of the D.C. Booth Historic National Fish Hatchery and Archives revealed that the hatchery generates more than $2 million in business revenues and $141,000 in local and state taxes. And these values don't have anything to do with angling. These dollars, in turn, support seven jobs in the local area, 
and these kinds of dollars really do matter to a rural area like the Spearfish South Dakota region. Even more importantly, hatcheries are the storefronts of aquatic resource conservation. When I'm in line at the grocery store talking to someone about what I do for a living, as soon as they hear fisheries, they often assume that I work at the state warm water fish hatchery located in Carbondale, not the university. More than fish and wildlife conservation offices, more than academic programs, more than most outreach programs, hatcheries engage the public, educate them, and make them care about aquatic resources. It's not their primary focus or mandate, but hatcheries help to stem the tide of so-called nature deficit disorder and relay the importance of our nation's fisheries to generations of Americans that are, sadly, becoming increasingly disconnected from nature. Even if you don't care about fishing, don't want to look at a fish in a tank, don't have any interest in fish whatsoever, our nation's fisheries should still matter to you because they increase the value of your home and property. Whether you enjoy it or not, fishing is considered a highly valued environmental amenity and it increases property value substantially. For example, in the state of Wyoming, access to quality angling opportunities increases property values by as much as 12% in the western part of the state. Statewide, the average increase in property value associated with angling productivity is 10%. I think that just about any home or landowner would gladly take a 10% increase in the value of their property, and productive fisheries can provide that increase. I've talked a lot about the value of our nation's fisheries, but it really is about more than just dollars and cents. Fish and other aquatic organisms are, of course, part of the ecosystems they inhabit, and they provide a range of fundamental ecosystem services, services that are essential for ecosystem function and resilience. Whether we are aware of it or not, these functions are a prerequisite to human existence, though they are not typically marketed or thought of as an economic good. This diagram illustrates some of the primary ecosystem services that fish can provide. They form an essential link in the food chain and help to regulate and stabilize aquatic ecosystems. Without fish, food webs and nutrient cycles in aquatic systems break down, and formerly functional productive systems can rapidly degrade. Fish also function as a genetic library for possible future use in medicine and aquaculture. They stimulate human interest in nature and provide aesthetic value as well. Certain ecosystem services generated by fish are also used as management tools, such as mitigating the growth of lake vegetation or controlling mosquitoes. Fish can also serve as sentinel species or indicators of ecosystem stress. And it's not an ecosystem service per se, but fish also provide value as educational tools and model species in biomedical research. Again, the average person probably isn't even aware of these services our nation's fisheries provide, but they do benefit from them. Sadly, our nation's fisheries also include more than 150 federally threatened and endangered fish. Maintaining biodiversity is important, and there is value in the continued existence of imperiled species. But it's difficult to monetize this value, especially for non-game species. You can assign the dollar figure to Snake River sockeye or pallid sturgeon relatively easily because at one point these fish had recreational and commercial value. But what about the many imperiled chubs, darters, and other small species? They have value too, but what is it? How do you put the price on the value of a tiny little fish that most people have never seen and never will? Economists try to come up with something called the total economic value of a species to address this point. Total economic value consists of recreational use, commercial use, as well as passive uses like aesthetic value or the value for ecotourism and bequest value. All of these values are measured by economists as the maximum amount of money a person would be willing to pay to protect the species and its habitat. There are challenges with this type of evaluation, but what it generally tells us is that the public's willingness to pay for restoration outweighs the actual cost of restoration, even for very costly programs like those implemented for spotted owl. It's a shame that our nation's fisheries include so many imperiled species, but we are committed to restoring them because biodiversity provides both tangible and intangible benefits to the American public. Our nation's fisheries. We now know that this is more than a red, white, and blue idea. Our nation's fisheries are real, tangible resources and provide us countless benefits. They feed us, provide us with jobs, and the chance to relax and reconnect with the natural world. By providing ecosystem services, our nation's fisheries support our lives without our even being aware of it, and they are an integral part of the natural and cultural legacy we will leave to future generations. 
When you think about fisheries, you probably don't immediately think of cultural identity or food security for future generations, but that is all inherent in our nation's fisheries, and that's also why it's so important to conserve and restore these valuable resources. In conclusion, fisheries and hatcheries matter. Our nation's fisheries help to define us as Americans, who we are, how we live, and what our future will look like. Hatcheries support aquatic resources that are significant to us, commercially, recreationally, culturally, and ecologically. Although I didn't describe the importance of commercial aquaculture, it is the future of seafood, here and throughout the world, and we have a commitment in the United States to make aquaculture an even more important part of our nation's fisheries. Finally, I would encourage those fisheries professionals who may be listening to consider using some of the facts, figures, and concepts I've described here to start a bigger conversation about our nation's fisheries. We are responsible for conserving our nation's fisheries, but also for communicating their value to the American public. With that, thank you for your time, and if you have questions, please feel free to contact me via email or on my fisheries and aquaculture themed blog, The Factual Fish Squeezer.